So thank you for coming. We're excited to have you here in the Providence uh, space. So we appreciate you, you coming here to learn more about this great organization that we have that has a very close relationship with the law school. Uh, there are internship opportunities available, externship opportunities available. It was an alternative spring break site, and then there are also fellowship opportunities available. So you'll hear from two of our alumni who are currently in their fellowships with the Center for Justice to hear about the great work that they're doing and what you can be doing to prepare yourself to apply for a position with this organization. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over. And uh, thank you again for coming. Thanks, uh, so I'm Rob McCraner. I'm the executive director and supervising attorney at the Rhode Island Center for Justice. And with me here are my colleagues, Curtis Pouliot Alvarez and Marissa Janton, who you are gonna, actually, you're gonna mostly hear from them uh, tonight, because they're gonna talk to you about their uh, fellowship experience. And uh, John Willemson Friedman is an attorney who also works in our office as director of community partnerships and policy advocacy. Um, so uh, what we'd like to do tonight is to give you um, first a brief overview and kind of introduction to the Center for Justice, who we are, what do we do, uh, how are we set up, uh, and I'm going to try to do that sort of succinctly and, and hit the, you know, the most important points so that I can then turn it over to Marissa and Curtis again to talk about their experiences and I think that you might be interested in that particularly because as you may know um, the fellowship positions that Curtis and Marissa have are exclusively open to Roger Williams Law School graduates. So that means all of you once you graduate would be eligible to apply to work here in a full-time paid staff attorney position at the Center for Justice. So I want you to hear what that what that's about. Um, just interested by a show of hands, so two L's, three L's, um, two L's, and three L's? Okay, are there any one L's here? Okay, cool. Uh, and um, I guess I should also say um, that apart from the Roger Williams Fellowship Program, we also have lots of other opportunities for folks to get involved here as externs, alternative spring break, volunteers, and in fact, I'm really happy to see two um, either current or former uh, such uh, law student placements uh, it, that folks have worked in our office or are working in our office now or are here, which is really great. Um, so um, one other question, just to get a sense, by a show of hands, how many of you have worked at either as how many of you have worked at either as an intern or a volunteer at a civil legal aid organization? Okay, and what just curious what organization where have you worked? Uh, Neighborhood Legal Services up in Lawrence, Mass. But I think they have a, a new name now. Okay, cool. When I was an undergrad. And what kind of program area were you, were you in? Is it housing or? Yeah, it was, uh, it was mostly doing intake, but then also representing people in housing mediation at the housing board. Okay, cool. And who else? Where uh, Catholic Legal Immigration Network in uh, Maryland. Okay, doing immigration work. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And other folks? Um, Rhode Island um, Legal Services. I was with the family unit. Uh, great. Rills and someone else? Yeah. Rills as well, but Equal Justice works on funding records. Okay, great. Excellent. Yeah, so that's, that's kind of helpful, right? Because that's sort of who we are, broadly speaking, right? The Rhode Island uh, Center for Justice, we're an independent, nonprofit, public interest law center, uh, and our our area of practice generally is civil legal aid, right? So what we don't do is criminal um, criminal law. But other than that, so you know your typical civil legal matters that a public interest law center would take on would be uh, housing, public benefits, um, it could be environmental justice, um, pretty broad range. Uh, and we're going to talk about within that. Um, that broad sort of sphere of potential work, what we were actually working on now. Uh, so one thing I just I do want to highlight at the beginning because it's a really distinctive part of the of our organization, our model, and I think it should be it should be really exciting if you're thinking about being a public interest lawyer. If that's what you think you might want to do, um, is doing that work in partnership with community-based organizations that are on the front lines of social justice work that understand issues like the ones we just, just mentioned, um, but aren't lawyers, but they really want to work with lawyers, right? So they want people like you that have a social justice passion uh, and come out of law school with skills and a desire to you know, make an impact as an attorney. Uh, so our organization gives you the, the opportunity to, to do this work in partnership with groups like this. So Fuerza Laboral, 
the Community Action Partnerships, the George Wiley Center, which is this really fantastic community organizing group in Pawtucket, Pro Bono Collaborative uh, at Roger Williams, Providence Student Union, Rhode Island Jobs with Justice, Committee for Better Banks, and the House of Hope. So these are all, um, generally, these are community-based organizations um, that we work with. Uh, okay, next. All right, so our three program areas that we have been working in since we launched the Center for Justice, which was uh, last year, the, the, in the beginning of 2015, are housing rights, workers' rights, and utility justice. Next slide, please. Okay, um, in housing, what do we do? So in our housing program, we provide free legal assistance to low-income tenants, um, and what we're primarily focused on are substandard housing conditions and, and displacement, right? So uh, for low-income uh, renters who are struggling uh, to, uh, to keep their housing or to, to, to fix uh, the, the conditions in their housing, there is really, there are very few resources, right? There are very few attorneys um, because if you can't afford to hire an attorney, um, the only other place that you could go in Rhode Island really would be Rhode Island Legal Services to get housing legal assistance. And if those, if those of you who work there might know, there's you know, only limited types of cases that rules can take on and very limited capacity. So when we started doing this work, really, there's no shortage of folks coming, you know, coming out and saying, yes, I'd really like a lawyer to represent me and um, help bring my landlord to court to fix um, these horrible conditions that I'm living in. Next slide, please. Okay, the next uh, program area that we work in is workers' rights, but specifically, because that's a kind of a pretty broad topic, what we're, what we're really focused on are the rights of low-wage immigrant workers, right? So the folks that clean the buildings that we're in, the folks that uh, serve us food in restaurants, that do landscaping, um, that do domestic work. And sadly, in our country, that, uh, that workforce suffers uh, a wildly disproportionate incident or, or rate of wage theft. Wage theft means when you don't get paid what you're supposed to get paid under the law, so you're not paid minimum wage or overtime, um, or you're not paid at all. And the way that we assist those workers is that we partner again with a community group called Fuerza Laboral, which is this really great worker center in Central Falls, Rhode Island. So Curtis and Marissa go to Fuerza Laboral twice a month. They meet with workers who are mainly presenting these kinds of, uh, of issues, of wage theft matters, and then we sue their employers, uh, or their former employers, to get the money that they're owed, um, which makes you feel really good when you get that money. Uh, okay, and the last um, program area that I want to mention um, is, is also the one that's kind of featured in this poster, this handout that, that we distributed, because it's going to be a, an event that I hope all of you can come to. It's going to be really fantastic here in this building on October 25th. It's about utility justice, this third area that we work in. Utility justice is about access to really basic things like heat, uh, hot water, uh, electricity, and our, uh, our approach to doing this work has, get, again, been to, to partner with a community organization. It's the one that, I, one of them that I mentioned at the beginning, the George Wiley Center in Pawtucket. So um, we go to the George Wiley Center and we meet with low-income uh, households that are at risk of or experiencing shutoff or their utility service of their electricity or their gas. But what we're specifically focused on are those households that have medical issues. So what we found out when we started doing this work last year, and this you know, is shocking to a lot of people, but in Rhode Island, every year there are thousands of utility shutoffs to low-income households including shutoffs that put people in the hospital, that cause people to be evicted, that cause children to miss school, people to lose their jobs, right? And this hospitalization consequence, right, is pretty significant. So people on respirators, on oxygen machines, who need electricity to survive, have their electricity shut off. Uh, and what we you know, sort of found out is that that's actually against the law, but it's happening anyway. And so this has been a really big project for us, not just because we represented or provided legal assistance to lots of, of, of households on this area, but also because we filed a class action lawsuit against National Grid and the regulatory agency in Rhode Island for violating those laws. And so that, um, that also is kind of a distinctive part of the Center for Justice, which makes us a little bit different from other civil legal aid organizations. So we work really closely with community-based organizations. That's, that's a big part of our model. But we're also able to bring impact litigation, which many other organizations aren't, either because of their funding or capacity. Um, 
And so, um, so that's a really exciting part of the Center for Justice's work. Um, this is just a, this slide is from a magazine article um, that featured this lawsuit, um, this, this work around utilities access and um, the fellowship program. So I'm just gonna say a few things about um, the sort of overall parameters of this, then I'm gonna hand it off to, to Marissa. So the fellowship program is open to recent Roger Williams graduates. That means that you need to have graduated within the previous five years. So the next fellow, uh, the next fellow staff attorney position will begin in January of 2017. We will very shortly begin the process of advertising this fellowship and accepting applications and interviewing folks. And so if you um, are, um, so, so you would have to have graduated within the, the previous five years of this uh, January 2017 start date in order to be eligible for this, this fellowship and, and the, this coming fellowship, and that's the cycle that we're on. So every January, a new fellow will be hired. Um, so I talked about, and Curtis and Mercer are gonna talk about what you do as a staff attorney, um, really important that if you're interested in this, what we wanna know is that you wanna do community-based lawyer, you want to work closely with community groups, um, and it's a two-year full-time position as well. Um, I'll ask now if you have any questions kind of about the overall um, parameters. If you want to hold your question to, that's fine, because I think it'll, 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 there's probably a lot of information that Curtis and Marissa provided that will be responsive to that, and then we'll take questions and answers at the end. But any, any questions you want to ask about any of that so far? Okay, great. Marissa. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Marissa Janton. I graduated from uh, Roger Lynn School of Law in 2011. Um, I actually was, I was one of the first fellows that um, uh, started here at the center. I um, clerked for uh, Justice uh, Flaherty uh, for the first, right after I graduated from law school. Um, during law school, I uh, externed for Judge Smith in federal court, and I worked for uh, I was a rule nine for the Attorney General's office. So I actually didn't have any direct client contact uh, before I started here. So I was a little nervous coming in. I think that a lot of uh, my friends that I clerked with, um, you know, went to big firms, and I never had an interest in that. Um, but I always knew in high school, even before that, that I wanted to work in a community-based something, trying to make. Um, the world's a better place. I'm a little bit older. I was a teacher in Providence, a Spanish teacher in Providence before I went to law school, but I really wanted to try to make a difference in this world before I ever even went to law school. Um, I applied for this position because it was the right decision for me at the place I was in my life. I remember being in a, a medical legal collaborative class and learning about the type of work community lawyers basically could do and thinking that's the kind of job I wanted. <coughs> Unfortunately at that time that job didn't exist and um, luckily for me uh, all of a sudden the center came along and the job did exist. So I applied for it and was lucky enough to get um, a position here. I um, So I started here and I, I just remember thinking kind of to loop back to where I started, I, I don't have a lot of contact with clients you know I didn't have that experience where a lot of my other friends did clinics and I recommend if you can do a clinic um, because I was really nervous to come in here and not not know what I was <laughs> necessarily doing um, I knew I had the legal skills the writing skills those kind of skills but I was really nervous about the day-to-day -day type of things and you know I'm good with people but you know the interviewing and all of that stuff you can only learn so much from a book um, so I guess, you know, we were asked to talk about some of the best uh, parts of the fellowship and what we've learned so far. And I'm coming up on two years and I think I've learned a lot um, and have just had a really great experience. I've been really lucky in so many ways to have been put in this position. I think one of them has been basically just your whole, um, the whole idea of client contact. So to go back to the other clerks that I was with, most of them are in big firms and they're still doing document reviews and, and depositions and they're holed up in an office somewhere and they haven't had the opportunity to do, somebody's laughing about this, <laughs> to do, you know, real, I don't want to say they are real lawyers and they get 
probably get paid a lot more than you will in this position, but um, they, uh, you know, they're doing paperwork and they're not on the ground. Their feet aren't on the ground and they're not in court and they're not meeting people every day. And some of them might like that. Some people are made for that. But if you're in public interest or you're even here today, you probably aren't. So, um, you know, all of a sudden, I, I'm meeting people. I'm at, a, I'm at a clinic, so we do clinics. We don't meet people here. We go to actual, out to the community, and we meet with people and address their concerns and, and decide whether or not they have a legal claim. And um, so that's one thing uh, that you, it's great, we do three legal areas, and you become an expert in those legal areas really quickly. Um, it becomes intimidating at first, and you think utility law, administrative law, I slept through admin law, but um, you know, you become an expert because you have to to help your client. You have to learn that, and you have to know what you're doing, and then you do wage theft, and you, you need to know FLISA, the Fair Labor Standards Act. You need to know it inside and out if you're going to do a good job. Um, and you need to know RIMWA and all of these types of laws that you didn't even know the name of before you started, you become an expert in because that is how you win. And this is the type of environment where you know, you're know you not the, a general civil litigation. You'll hear people say that, I'm a civil litigation general lawyer. We don't do that. We do specify like very specific law and that's all you do all day, but it gives you a chance to be really good at what you do. And we also do things like the interviewing, we, we draft complaints, we draft motions. Normally when you start out as a lawyer, you don't get to do that. You don't just do that, you know, your second, your third week. And of course, you know, Rob reviews it or I would review it when Curtis started working here. Of course someone is looking at your work at all times, but normally at that stage in the game, you're not doing that kind of work. And here you get to do that. Um, secondly, I think, you get this amazing hands-on experience. And that's where I, why I talked about you know, not being in a clinic. Um, I think that was a, a bit of um, uh, one of my, um, what's the best word? I can't think of. Something that I could have done more in law school. Because here, I didn't know how to e-file. A lot of you did. Hannah knew how to do it when she was here with us. Um, and that was great. I was really impressed because I didn't know how to e-file. I didn't even know what e-file was. But you know, the federal and the state courts use an e-filing system, and you can't do it by hand anymore. That is just a basic skill that I didn't have coming in. Now, of course, you learn it really quickly, but you know, it's a hands-on thing that you have to do. And of course, you do something three or four times, you learn how to do it. Um, basically, going into court, call the calendar. You do it. You have to do it here. That was like, Rob was like, see you later. Have a nice day. <laughs> Good luck with that. You know, it came with me, but I had to figure it out for myself. Um, you argue motions in court. He was there with me. He sat behind me. He, you know, if I was struggling in any way, but I argue motions in superior court within the first six months. You don't normally have an opportunity to do that in another position. Um, I would say that um, I did depositions. That was amazing. I got to do a deposition within my first six months. It was a bed bug case, but it was deposition. <laughs> and and um, I will always remember that. And it was just a you know, wonderful opportunity to be there, to learn, to learn how I should have done it, to learn you know, things I could improve on, but also realize things that I did well. Um, you do it, I did interrogatories, requests for production, and you're drafting all of this stuff at once that normally you wouldn't be doing right out of law school. Um, also, like Rob was mentioning, uh, we do a class action. We're involved in a class action. That started before I finished my first year. And I was able to be involved in something that made a huge difference in a huge number of people's lives. And not just with my research, but just also with my writing. Hi, welcome. <laughs> and with a lot of different um, just a lot of different ways that I could be part of a, a bigger team. So it's not just that you're an individual attorney for a small number of people, but you also get to play a role in a bigger picture. Um, and so you play a role as part of a team and as a team member, and you do what you need to do to fill in as part of that team. And it kind of allows you to use different skills that you might have. And for me, it was more my writing and research skills from when I had been at the Supreme Court. That was my strength. Um, and other people had other strengths, and we just all got together as a team, and we've done really good work and helped a lot of people because of that. And then, um, basically, I think also, um, like I had been saying before, you are making a direct impact in people's lives. Um, you know, for us and for many of us, and now I know that during law school it's a little different, but growing up, you know, a paycheck of 
um, you know, for some of us, $400 or $300 or $500 might not seem like life altering or life changing, but for some of my clients, it is. Um, it's food on their table, it's diapers on their child, um, it's rent for a month. And if somebody doesn't pay them after they have worked for over a week, for two weeks, that is life changing. So if you can get that person to pay because you've sent a lawyer's letter, because you've had them come in, because you've, you've threatened that you're going to go to court or you've helped file a DLT complaint, it makes a difference and you're like making a direct impact in their lives and it makes you feel good about going to law school and deciding to become a lawyer. Um, and, and that goes for all the areas of our law. Uh, Curtis will probably talk about housing because he's just brilliant when he does housing cases. And I can't think of anything um, that is more important than um, helping somebody have a roof over there, a safe, uh, healthy roof over their head. But, um, you know, making a difference in people's lives every day because you went to law school and you're, you've made a decision to do this type of law, I can't think of something that's more important. I come here every day happy. I leave home, I, I leave to go home happy because I feel like I've made a difference in somebody's life or I'm in the process of making a difference in someone's life. It's not about a paycheck, it's not about power, it's not about, um, you know, prestige of what I do. It's because I know I'm doing the right thing and I went to school because, I chose this school because I believe in those things. Um, basically, and I can tell you today, I, I'm interviewing for a new job because um, at the end of January when the new fellow comes, um, I'm out. Uh, <laughs> so I have a two-year two -year role. Um, but I can tell you, I, you know, they asked me, why you? Why, why should you be the one? And I was able to sit there and say, because with only, two, you know, with only a few years out or two years experience on the ground and then my one-year clerkship, I've already, you know, been in federal court, I've been in state supreme, uh, superior court, state district court, state family court, state probate court, and administrative DLT, and the, the DPU. And I don't know how many, any, anybody else that can honestly say that, that, that is in my place or that graduated with me. I really, even the people that graduated with me, I don't think they could say that if they've been practicing this long and if they've been practicing continuously. After I left uh, Judge Flaherty, I had twin boys and stayed home for two years. And that was the break I took. And I still don't think anybody else could have the same experience I've had in these short two years. So that's all I want to say. I want to give Curtis enough time. But um, I've been really, really lucky to have been given this opportunity. And I loved every one of my clients. They are amazing people. They just needed some help and they haven't been given the same opportunities, especially legal representation as other people have been given because they have more money or the means to have to do it. So thank you for listening. Go ahead, buddy. <laughs> she was right in one thing. I am brilliant. <laughs> so, um, so my name is Curtis Pouliot Alvarez. I am a um, 2015 graduate of Roger Williams. Um, I've been with the center for about nine, ten months now. Nine months. Who's key? Who's counting? Um, for about nine months, and um, so I've had an, um, a really, I've had a really good time. And so there's four main things I'd like to talk to you guys about about um, my experience here, and. Um, I think it's true generally for legal services. Um, it, or it's true for legal services in general. So the first one is that it's really tough work. And not that um, the education that you're getting doesn't adequately prepare you for it, um, but it's tough because you're operating within a legal system um, that isn't designed to accommodate the problems of poor people. Um, the courts aren't used to poor people having legal representation in civil cases. And so when they do come with a lawyer, it's our job. Um, and it's an uphill battle, but it's our job to educate the other attorneys and the courts about the laws that are on the books to protect your client, but that they've probably never read or encountered or, or, or seldom do. Um, and as far as the agencies, you're also dealing with the bureaucracy of a, a slow-moving government, uh, underfunded, um, services, the DLT is underfunded when it comes to in investigating worker complaints. They just don't have 
um, the resources to do it. So it it's challenging in that you you can't always get the outcome the outcome that the law prescribes. You can't always get um, it as soon as your client needs it, um, and so it's it's tough work. That's the bad news. That's all. I'll, that's all I'll say. I mean, he said that it's number four. I told him to start off with it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, really, the second thing that I want to talk to you about, or to mention, is, you know, you, in an opportunity, in with the Rhode Island Center for Justice, you're you're going to get your, you're going to get the opportunity to get your hands really dirty, get get your to dig in into um, these three areas of law to really learn the area of law. Um, you're going to have, I did the client. You're going to have a client from day one. You're going to have clients probably from day one. Um, you're going to learn how to interview clients. You're going to um, learn how to counsel clients, which is a, a skill that um, can't. It, it just takes practice and a lot of practice. I'm still learning. Um, you're going to be. Um, Marissa mentioned it, but you're going to be doing a lot of. Uh, we don't have. Um, legal assistance, so you're doing a lot of your own drafting um, of letters, motions, pleadings, um, all types of different filings. Um, you're going to get a lot of time in court. You, you have the opportunity to be in front of judges often. Sometimes it gets, um, sometimes it gets to be a lot because court time takes away from time that you could be doing other things. And you're not, when you're in court, sometimes you're, you're sitting there for a period of time. Um, you're also going to get the opportunity to practice administrative law, which is a really good skill to have being in front of administrative agencies um, and the process of appealing those decisions. Um, it, it's, a, it's a, I think, a really valuable skill to have um, no matter where you go out after your two years. Um, I've been able to go to clients' homes, um, interview them there. Um, I do as Marissa mentioned, a lot of landlord tenant stuff. So I go to their homes, I take pictures, um, I accompany code enforcement on inspections. I work with, I try to work with landlords if they're not represented. Um, and so you, you, you have the opportunity, uh, I mean, not really the opportunity, you'll have to get your hands dirty and really dig in into this law and get all, and you're gonna get a lot of valuable skills that will, will follow you um, the rest of your career. The third thing is that, and it kind of goes off of number two, is that you're going to learn how to be a lawyer. You're going to learn how to, you're going to learn how to practice law, to be a well-rounded litigator. Um, you're going to learn your rules of civil procedure because you're going to have trials and you're going to need to know that. You're going to, um, you're going to practice in front of district court, superior court. You might have the opportunity um, to be in front of the Supreme Court. Um, you're going to be in front of administrative agencies, federal court. I have two cases now in federal court, um, so you're going to really be a well-rounded litigator at the end of at the end of the two years. Not only that, but you're going to learn how to communicate with other attorneys, how to negotiate um, settlements, how to how to um, position yourself um, in those negotiations so that you get the best outcome for your client. Um, and um, the last one, I think, and probably the most important, um, for me anyways, is you're really going to get the opportunity to get to know the community that you're working in. And by community, I don't mean the legal community. I mean the, the community of people that you're serving. Um, where for, for a lot of the time this summer, we were in the George Wiley Center. For, a couple, for about a month, we were there five days a week, um, switching off. Um, really just working one-on-one -on -one with individuals who are in, facing utility emergencies where they're, they're in crisis. Um, but you're really going to get to know your community, the people you're you know, working. You're going to get to know um, their needs and how you can meet those needs. Um, you'll have the opportunity to do clinics. Um, we do a lot of outreach. We take opportunities to train people in the community who um, have direct contact with people. Um, people who are our clients, so um, like the United Way, um, CAP agencies, um, we take the opportunity to let them know the kind of work we're doing and um, update them on, for example, the utility litigation uh, that, that we're working on and what clients' rights are now under this framework. Um, 
yeah, so that's it. It's a lot. But that's um, kind of in a nutshell what um, you can expect based on my nine months here. <laughs> No, I was just going to ask Curtis to just quickly describe the public interest things that you did sure. when you were a law student. Yeah, I actually wrote them down. Um, so, <laughs> so many not that I remember. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, I began. I went to law school interested in public interest law, um, and I and I began um, as a one L rep in Able, and I was a member of the board of Able throughout all three years of law school. Um, I also planned ASB um, my second year, um, and the I think the, the year that we put ASB on the map. Um, it, it's the year that we got a really good funding stream for ASB um, and, and was able to expand. Um, I did um, a lot of time, I, I did a lot of hours of time with the federal public defenders here in Providence. Um, representing indigenous um, clients. A lot of them were um, immigrants who are charged with illegal reentry. Um, I did some time um, with uh, CPCS out of Fall River, which is a public defender agency there. Um, I did the immigration clinic with Professor Gonzalez. Um, please, do, please do a clinic. I can't, I, I just can't stress how important it is to get that experience. It's, it, I mean, Doing internships and externships are also excellent. Um, make sure you're getting client interaction, and, and you get that with the clinics. Just make sure you're getting client interaction. I think I, I don't think that can be stressed enough. It, learning how to speak, talk to people is like the most important. Um, learning how to listen and talk to people is the most important. One of the most important skills you can learn as an attorney. Um, and I participated in alternative spring break too. I went to New Orleans and worked for a civil legal service organization down in New Orleans that was even 10 years after Katrina was still helping people recover from from that disaster so um, I was really active um, in the law in, in the public interest um, area of the community and um, so there's no excuse for you guys not to be <laughs> sir um, do you guys ever feel that you're almost disrespected by the court because of the type of clients you represent and how do you kind of, especially being kind of a baby lawyer, pardon the term, no, but get, get past that point of, no, I got this, you know, and, and can kind of stand up to the judges on the bench? Sure. I prefer baby lawyer. Um, <laughs> I'm sure I'll prefer it 10 years from now. Too. <laughs> um, so, I, I, I think maybe disrespected by the court is, is, is a strong term. I think, I would say maybe misunderstood a little bit. Um, I can speak to you mostly from my landlord tenant experience um, in that for a year, and it's still, this is still the case, but f probably forever, as long as there's been um, district court has heard these cases, um, the outcomes are just always the same. Um, the tenant goes in there without a lawyer, the lawyer for the landlord talks to them, they come up with this agreement that you move out by a certain date and we, you don't have to pay the rent, right? That's what happens in 95% of cases most of the time, regardless of whether or not this tenant has been living in horrible conditions. Um, and so it's a challenge in trying to assert defenses to their claim for rent um, and getting the court to understand that, yes, this person has lived in these conditions and no, they couldn't have just moved um, because they're poor and they can't, then the landlord has a security deposit. So um, it, it's a process of, I think, it's, it'll take a while, but educating the court um, and getting them to see um, what we're really trying to do is, isn't is rolling. They're interested in closing cases out. And the interest is getting people in and out, and um, fighting against that is difficult. Um, I don't know, do you have other insight into that? Uh, I, I think you. Marissa, maybe I was just thinking as, as hearing the question, your experience. Um, appearing on behalf of consumers at the Division of Public Utilities where there had never been legal representation, right? And sort of the 
you know, kind of what that experience was like as a, as a new lawyer, but also as part of a new program, right? Like for the first time having a presence there, and then how that's changed over the last year. Yeah, so. that's that's true. They didn't. Yeah. So at the public utilities, they were never used to a lawyer being there. I would say, or maybe one percent of the time, there was a lawyer there, um, and so they have both informal and formal hearings. So we showed up the informal hearings and they would say, you don't need a lawyer here. You don't need, and we would say, but they have a right to one, so we're here. Um, and then, you know, we would we would try to present evidence because you have the right to do that under the Administrative you know, Procedures Act and under their actual regulations. And they didn't know what to do with it. They would say, no, we don't want it. No, that's okay. And you would say, no, I, I would like to pr present this for you to consider in your decision that you're supposed to make because they already had written their decision. They already had things done, and you would ask them to, and you know, we now have, we now, and going forward, we're really glad we did that, because we actually have tapes of them saying, no, we don't want it, no, and you could hear it in the background printing out their decision that, wow. that they had already made it. Um, so we're really glad, because those were all actually taped. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> and so that, was, that was really interesting. And then even in the formal hearings, um, National Grid was always represented by an attorney. That's basically his job. And then the, the consumers, if they showed up, would be by themselves. And it was just completely David versus Goliath. And all of a sudden, there's an attorney there. And they didn't really know how to deal with us. They would have, half of the time, there was an attorney that would be the you know, the neutral arbiter, and then half of the time it was an engineer. So we would stand up and object, and they would not know what that meant. So that would also be a challenge. Um, and, and then, you know, just go, they also would be sending us letters telling us what we could and couldn't do as attorneys, as, as an office, which was really interesting and, yeah, interesting and challenging. So they are just not used to on it, like Curtis said, um, people uh, not of power. They were used to National Grid having an attorney. They were buddy buddies. They would they would be talking to one another as though they were friends. You know, how you doing? How you doing? Like, because that's what they did all the time. So for the consumer to then have a, a representative, they they didn't even know what to do with a third person in the room because they had just always operated that way. And a lot of it has to do with money. That's just the way it was. And so you know we're kind of trying to interrupt that cycle. Um, and even us utilizing something like the Rhode Island Minimum Wage Act, which is what um, you can use, Rhode Island just enacted that in, I think, 2012. Um, it's a private right of action if you have suffered wage theft, uh, because Rhode Island has a higher minimum wage than the federal, uh, the federal government does. And so I actually tried to take a case in district court, and the judge had to look up the statute, because she didn't believe that I was taking a case under a real statute. She thought it was fake. So, but it's the first time that someone has like tried to use their their you know their power and try to use their private redaction because no one is using it, no one is doing that because people aren't asserting their rights because usually poorer people don't have representation. It's just another example of like Curtis is saying, like shaking up and just having them reconsider who should be in front of them, not the same old, same old. So it's a challenge. I, I think like Curtis said, it's more of a misunderstanding of us and being there, but it's kind of fun. Any other questions? Come on. <laughs> Since nobody's asking. <laughs> um, I think it might be helpful for people to hear, you mentioned um, impact litigation, mm -hmm. just so that there's an understanding in this group of what the difference yeah. is between individual representation and impact litigation. Yeah. So the cases that Marissa and Curtis have been talking about, um, I think you get the sense that their clients are individuals or, or individual households, and um, the relief that results from their the legal assistance that Curtis and Marissa provide is really specific to that one household, that, that one client. Uh, and impact litigation, uh, the idea is to have a much broader impact, right? So if it's uh, a class action, which doesn't necessarily have to be, but it, that's the sort of one example we've mentioned here tonight is our class action lawsuit. There are upwards of 6,000 households in the state of Rhode Island that have received a benefit from that lawsuit. Um, so obviously touches a lot more, a lot more people. Um, also, you know, one thing that you know you might want to know, and I think kind of makes this exciting as well, is that that lawsuit came out of the individual work that we were doing in our first year. And the the cases, you know, that Versa described, and in fact, 
the way that the Division of Public Utilities was kind of violating its own laws and not allowing people to exercise their rights in their hearings, that's why we sued them, right? So by taking on these cases, it sort of gives you insight into systemic violations of rights and that you know, sort of what, what gives us the opportunity to bring these larger, larger cases. So now that we have a room where most of the three L's have left, because that's a three L class. <laughs> I want to where's everybody going? Um, a L R. So it just, it just, it just came from Speak to the one L's and two L's mm -hmm. about what they might be able to do in the summer when they don't know much and how you might use them and those kinds yeah. of opportunities. So Summer internships at the Rhode Island Center for Justice are fantastic. Hannah will tell you that. <laughs> uh, but I think I think Hannah's you know experience this past summer as a summer intern is really a great one, a great great example um, because um, one of the things that Hannah did was to focus on um, a utility justice matter. It's it's a, you know a little complicated, but basically the regulatory agency had opened up a docket or kind of in some ways like an investigation. And our office was representing certain stakeholders, so the, the, in particular the George Wiley Center, um, uh, in relation to the rights or the interest of low-income utility consumers. So all that you know kind of sounds pretty complicated, and that's why we needed some research to be done. And so Hannah did the research, which is something that you know you, you get to do generally in a summer internship is, is legal research. But I think the cool, really cool part about it was that that research was applied in a presentation that Hannah made to about 15 or 20 people that were members of the George Wiley Center, board members, folks from other organizations from around the state that came to hear her uh, talk about this, this administrative docket and what their interests were and kind of how to think strategically about it. She did a fantastic job. People were engaged. I was so impressed because there were a lot of questions and she had an answer to every question uh, that was really great. Um, and so I think that was just like a really cool summer internship project because it gave her an opportunity to dive into what I think was a new area of law, but, but also do more than just write a memo, right? It was actually, because it, it really drew on this community partnership um, facet of our, um, of our organization. And so if any of you are interested in a summer internship or an academic year externship, please um, let me know or talk to the folks at the Feinstein Center because um, we would love to have you in our office. Uh, can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, do you have any opportunities for this semester? And do you have uh, opportunities that will make us satisfy you that you all want to learn? What was the question? In New York. Thank you. Do you want to come in? Yeah. In New York? Come or? back. We were wondering if you guys had any uh, openings for volunteers or pro bono for this semester in particular, and whether you can, whether you have any programs that will satisfy the 50 hour. We're always interested in taking volunteers, the 50 hour. Um, so that's a little complicated because it doesn't mesh exactly with Roger Williams' 50 hour requirement, but assuming the supervisor will sign off on it complying with the New York pro bono requirement, those hours will count, and my guess is that they, will, you know, as long as you're doing um, work for a nonprofit legal services organization uh, that represents low income people, you would be fine. Okay. It's not a guarantee, but. Take a card. And you have internships open for uh, this semester, right? Yeah. Here, if you're interested, just contact me. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so they're running off the ALR. <laughs> <laughs> The other thing I would just add, in terms of the work you can do with us for internships, uh, particularly what Hannah did, but what a lot of the folks that have spent a semester with us, that work has an ongoing value. I'm still quoting Hannah's research in that document, and it's true for other people who've worked with. And you know, it has a real practical, real-world impact, which I think is is a, a cool thing to have as a sort of 1L, 2L internship. You'll leave, a, you'll leave a legacy behind. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> really. Rob, will you talk a little bit about what you're looking for when you're deciding which interns to hire, which externs to hire, fellowships? What kinds of experiences do you want students to have? What kinds of skills? Sure, yeah. And I mean, we are um, I'm interested in talking to anybody who has an interest in the center. But we do, you know, we do have to be selective because we have limited resources. Um, and for me, Every volunteer um, uh, placement, every internship, 
you know, requires and deserves um, some thought and planning and supervision, right? Um, because I want it to be meaningful for you and I want it to be productive for us as well. And so that means kind of upfront um, sort of thought and, and, um, and planning and, and sort of uh, coming up with a, with a solid work plan. So um, since that's required, I have to, you know, we have a limited uh, ability to, to do that. And so for those limited spots, I'm looking for folks who have um, ideally a demonstrated commitment to public interest work. Um, you know, sort of given where you're at um, in, in law school, it'd be great to see that you've done some other kind of public interest work, um, either in law school or before. Um, language, foreign language skills are a real premium, particularly Spanish, but other language skills are very valuable to us as well. Um, and um, I, I would say an interest in, an understanding of, and an interest in this model of community lawyering, right? So it's really helpful if you are interested in um, affecting social change as a lawyer by working with um, or working with collective efforts, right? Groups of people that want to affect social change. That gets us really motivated and, and, and psyched. And mm -hmm. on that topic, to learn more about that, come to the October 25th yes. um, event because you'll learn a lot about this model. It, as it applies in the utility justice area. And bring other people to that. And bring other people. <laughs> yeah. Lots of yeah. people. You have one <laughs> bonus point. <for> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks everybody for coming. Thank you. Thank you. One thing I did want to mention earlier, and I regret that the theory also left. Um, we always get a lot of questions about from students who wonder how to afford working in a public interest career just because, as you mentioned, there are work, people working at big firms that are making a lot more money, but there are a lot of programs um, that exist right now to facilitate, to support those who choose public interest careers. Um, the law school has a public interest for loan repayment assistance program that you can use for up to three years after you graduate. What? Funds from. I, yeah, true. I, I've taken yeah, it. Yeah, you just changed my life. I've, I've taken <laughs> it. That's what I'm here to do. Got my loan paid for the next year. Yeah. And that can happen for three years if he stays in a public interest position. Um, there's also the College Cost Reduction Act of America. So if you stay in a public interest position for 10 years, qualifying employment, the remainder of your loans will be forgiven. Um, so, so there are programs out there, income-based repayments. So your payment loan, your loan payments are based on what you earn. Um, so, so your your repayments can be significantly reduced as a result if you're in a qualifying uh, position, which something like this would absolutely qualify you for. So, so there are programs out there because we need public interest lawyers. We need more of them, and they, they there there can't be the reason you're not doing it is because I, I can't afford to live off of the salary. So. So hopefully more will be done, but uh, there are a lot of programs. Equal Justice Works has a lot of webinars on their website to um, let you know what the options are. You can obviously talk to my office as well. We have a lot of resources as well. So, so spread the word, okay? This is not an excuse to not be able to be a lawyer, right? <laughs> Veronica, talk, just mention the summer stipend. For oh, of course, the yes, and Curtis was on the stipend. But that's another thing you did while you were in law school. He yes. helped yeah. determine who received stipends. So for students who are in a public interest uh, position over the summer, uh, if it's in uh, working typically in a public defender, direct legal services, or other sort of you know uh, public interest setting, you can qualify for a public interest stipend that can give you funding over the summer. You have to work for 300 hours over the summer to get the award. There's a competitive process on everybody. We don't have enough money to fund everybody, but um, usually around 30 or so students each year um, receive funding for that. Because Lindy got it this year in Haiti, so. Um, so that's another program, especially for the first years you may not have heard of, but just keep your ears open to it. Um, the application process will start in the spring. Another thing um, that um, didn't come up was the alternative spring break project. Usually there's a placement mm -hmm. at the Center for Justice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you.